Okay, so it's 5 p.m. It's time to start. Uh, today we have a third lecture in a series of lectures from Ivan Schreiber. Uh, this, there is no need to introduce you because I already did this several times. Uh, so we're going to have about zeros. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> the final one. And uh, today, again, I'll try to do it in a slow motion, and again, English. And actually, I would maybe ask you guys, Tima, you're a good person for that as well. Uh, all these terms are really familiar to me in English, and I will ask you in Russian, and sometimes you help me, and maybe next time we, uh, some other people can profit it in Russian, because I really don't know many terms in Russian language. But whatever. We we are not we are not yeah. Uh, the, we 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 will see because uh, yeah I, I mean I, I think it's a good thing to know all of that in English but sometimes I mean as we in Russia we are required to have it in Russian as well. So Introduction to electromagnetism. As we yesterday had in special relativity, I tried to scratch the surface just to give the basic idea, the understanding. We don't go, we don't have time to go deep into details. We don't want to. Uh, I don't want to spend my last time, last day in Tomsk, uh, giving the lecture about electromagnetism. But whatever. Why electro? First of all, why electromagnetism? Why do we need to study electromagnetism? And yesterday, it was uh, already the first reason for that, or actually vice versa, electromagnetism, and uh, understanding of electric and magnetic phenomena, and how it comes together, uh, when Maxwell put it together and came up with the uh, speed of light, it gave a race to the uh, special relativity. So this is the first very important reason why uh, we have to understand what is behind all of that and why we have to study electromagnetism. The second thing, even more important, electromagnetism tells us about field. It's all based about field. And when we talk about quantum uh, mechanics or quantum physics, we always mention field in there, but quite often we don't understand what, or, or what it is. And first, the concept of the field appeared in electromagnetic theory. So, and all the four uh, interactions, uh, all four natural forces which we have, actually, let, let's go back and come up, which four forces we have? Uh, electromagnetic, gravity, weak and two nuclear forces, yeah, weak and strong. Yeah, so, uh, it gives us understanding of one of the most important uh, forces in our nature. So, and um, uh, we are doing this uh, classical field theory, but it gives the rest to quantum field theory as well. And then another thing, why it's important to study electromagnetism, if you go back in time, how it was done in the past, usually, First came engineers and were creating some devices. And then they were explaining how it was working. Yeah? And then this is how it was first, let's put it in this way, practice or experiment followed by the theory. When Maxwell came up with his electromagnetic equation, it was impossible to build experiment before theory. We had uh, electric uh, Theory, electric uh, phenomena, and it worked all well. Magnetic worked all well as well. But as soon as you try to put it all together, it stopped working. I mean, the equations, the description, it stopped working. And it was really created in his mind, this little addition to his equation, this ampere law, to ampere law. We'll see that later. And it was first theory created, and then it was... Uh, approved by experiment. And this is how we do physics nowadays. If we take CERN, right, what we were talking about uh, before, we have theory, 
happen and we have predictions and then we try to prove it with experiment. This is the way we do physics nowadays. So these are three important reasons for me why do we, it's important to understand electromagnetism. There are more probably, but this is what uh, I like to mention. As soon as, yeah, it's always this way. Thanks. So, in English language, uh, Jackson uh, book is the Bible of electromagnetic theory. But actually, I like a lot of this Tebe and Charwood, uh, Matter and Interactions. It's a really simple book. I really recommend it to all my students. It's a really simple book with a lot of explanations inside and many questions in there. So he raises the question, you have a time to think about that, and he gives the answer as well to this question. So it's really nice to follow the material and to understand it, like to, to give yourself an idea, do I understand it or I don't understand it. This, I, I find it one of the best books for electrodynamics. Um, so these are just uh, variables and units uh, we are using, yeah, for magnetic field, for electric field, for electric charge, uh, for electric charge density and magnetic, the same permittivity uh, or strengths of uh, electrical strengths or magnetic strengths, permeability. The, actually, in English language, we, most of the time we now use strengths, not permittivity or permeability, but whatever. It's still called this way in uh, in the past and speed of light. Again, for what, what happened? And uh, just for mathematical operators, if you these are really easy curl and gradient and divergence and nabla operator, but you need to know how it works. Okay, these are, they are simple, but this is what you need. In the uh, uh, in the theory uh, to to be able to operate with different equations. So this I already said. Yeah, this is the first example of free field theory, and it teaches us about special relativity. And this is the way how we do modern physics uh, nowadays. And I think I like we don't have it uh, here, but I like this. There is a simple. Um, experiment which I usually do with uh, little kids to show them electromagnetic force they don't and well, it's electrostatic force in this case if you take a um, scotch and you put it on the table and you put a second layer and then you rip off electrons out of one and then you show the kids how they interact two bands of scotch how they would uh, either um, retract yeah or connect to each other and this is a very, in very simple examples, yeah, or when we do like this electrostatic force, when we do like this with our hair, or we put a magnet on uh, the fridge or the compass, yeah, and we see how it's declined, the arrow, all of that, the needle of compass, all of that are simple examples which we can see in our everyday life when we talk about uh, theories, and um, so today we go briefly, of course, to introduction to the field to understand very, in a very simple way what it is, electrostatics and magnetostatics, of course, and then we go to the moving charge. Because what is interesting for us, of course, uh, there is electric field and magnetic field, and there is a charge, and electric field and magnetic field, they tell to the charge, yeah, they direct the charge, how it should move, and then charge starts to move, and then it creates, it changes by its movement, it's changing electric and magnetic field, and what we have at the end, we always have the beautiful interplay of all these things, charge and the field. But why uh, talking about that, uh, so first we go to the um, introduction to the field itself, and actually I will start to talk about the field, not about the field, but gravitational 
force field. Why that? Because we do understand, we really well, even though that we don't know how it is created, gravitational uh, field, the gravitational force, we do understand it pretty well. Newton understood it pretty well. And we start with a really simple example. And if you take a particle going down to the Earth, yeah, and the, we try to calculate the gravitational force uh, exerted by the Earth on the particle. We want, it, of course, we should understand when we calculate Earth exert on the particle, a gravitational force, but they are not working in one direction, right? There is another one, which is a particle exert the gravitational force on Earth as well. Uh, but we can uh, just disregard that, and you understand why, right? Why we only take one? Why? Too little. Hmm? Too, too little. little to exactly, taken. yeah. We can calculate it, but the force which is exerted by the particle on the Earth, I mean, it's negligible. Taking mass of one and another into account, right? Because we do remember that uh, gravitational force pretty much depends on the mass of the particle of the object. So, particle, yeah? Uh, first of all, let's think about field itself. What is field? If I ask you, what is a field? What, do, what is that? Know, for example, in, when you are concerning atoms, a field where electrons are in the atoms are the uh, because we can never find an electron, but a field is the place where we can propose there is electron. Okay, yeah. The proposable space where weight exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect space. Good. The, the main word in here is space, which I like. Whatever. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, another one. So energy. Energy, good. What is the field here? Another approach to the field, of course. Uh -huh. That's the question of the end. When you set up force, you actually condition the potentials, which is simply high level of magnetic and positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is the field? This is why he's the dean of physics. Actually, I mean, in principle, field is an observable, right? Just an observable with a precise map, like, yeah, created in any place in, uh, with a coordinate and a time, yeah, uh, in, in any uh, space. It, let's, let's take a temperature in this room. This is usually I take as an example for the students. We want to measure the temperature in this room. Of course, it won't be a vector, it would be a scalar, but just a number. I measure it there, next to the door. I measure it here, next to me, as the heat happens. And actually, I feel hot here now. <laughs> we measure it next to the window, and it's all different, right? So, depending on the coordinate, it's different. And if we measure it right now, or we measure that, um, 10 minutes or 15 minutes ago when we just entered the room, winter, summer, it would be different as well. So it's an observable which is depending very much on the coordinate and the time. And if we create a map of that, we have a field. That's it. And if you take a particle flying yeah, down, it's accelerating. Yeah? So when it's close to the Earth, it has an acceleration. This is Newton told us, yeah, the force uh, experienced is a mass. We multiply by acceleration, and this is, we measure, we just have a three vector, right? We measure the coordinate, yeah? And the acceleration pretty much depends on that, close to the Earth, or when it becomes closer to the, to the Moon, right? It would be different acceleration. So, we have to map it. Uh, we have to know the coordinate. But what is important as well, uh, there are some other objects, for example, like Moon, the moon next to our particle, and it would exert some force as well on that. And this would depend on time of the year or time of the day. It would be different. So we create a map of interaction between this particle and this space. And instead of saying that the Earth exerts a force on a falling object, we are saying that Earth sets a gravitational field on this object. And uh, 
then it becomes much easier. And let's say we, um, first of all, we, we split it in two parts, right? Then uh, we have acceleration and we have force. These are our fields. And this is the object of some mass, just a number. And it's really easy to measure. The field is difficult to measure because there are many coordinates and many different uh, time coordinates. But uh, the first one is very easy. And now, let's say, not we don't go to electric force yet, but let's say we have another particle falling down in the same field, right? And of course, we have the same problem, but we already measure the field. We just take the success from the previous one, we measured the field, so what we need to know, we need to know the mass of this particle, and then it becomes easier, right? So if we have this map, if we calculated this map, we can easily put any object in there. We split system in two parts. Then now, if we go to electric force, and we all know that, yeah? The formula, but then electric field, the force is equal to the charge applied by electric uh, field. And what is happening in there, we just use the same thing, right? This is our mass, or this is our number, electric charge. And this is our field, electric field. We just replace this and that, and we again, we split system in two parts. And this is the same thing as we had before. And uh, we say that uh, the object experiencing this field. So for electromagnetism, of course, we have electric field, we have magnetic field. And as I said uh, already before, we, uh, we have this beautiful interplay between the particle and the field because they are interfering with each other. We always have to recalculate, we always have to see how one influences another. So, charge and current. Uh, actually, here we, yeah, we have to, in the uh, C units, we us uh, usually measure charge in column. But uh, the thing is, it's not uh, very convenient, especially in high energy physics. We uh, prefer to um, connect it to the charge of electron. And so a number of, uh, we, um, we say it in numbers of charge of electrons. So quarks are having, leptons are have an integer, and quarks are have one or two, one sort or two sorts. Um, then, we don't want to talk about one particle, yeah? And we don't want to talk about one charge. We want to talk about many charges, especially in high energy physics. So we talk about charge density, charge per unit volume. And then we, it's just a notation how we use it, yeah? Uh, again, integrate over the given region or given volume and total charge in the area and the charge density is charged per this unit volume, and while our charges are starting to move, then um, we have a current, yeah? And a current, I mean, if we again, um, in a, a, some space, uh, many moving particles create a current density. Um, so the current density is just current per uh, unit and nothing else. Again, the more intuitive way to talk about that, um, if we, we take a continuous charge uh, distribution in, in uh, some small volume, yeah, and uh, we have, this is the, our small volume and we can define our uh, charge density and current density, and we can connect them and we can define our uh, current through uh, the uh, current density again. These are just different ways to, we take a volume in here, we take our charge, we take number of charges, this is just different way to represent number of charges moving together, uh, not to take 
uh, not to calculate it one by one, yeah, because we don't want to sum it up, but we want to calculate it all in a given volume. Uh, oh, this is a good thing, uh, coming actually at the right time. So, uh, when we are talking about charge density in a given volume, we have to remember that this is continuity equation, which says to us that charge density can change in time only if there is a compensation flowing in or out of the region. So we take it as a constant, and then if we start to do our calculation, we, uh, we say that it's unchangeable. It's always here yeah, if you look how to, uh, how to move it, because here, oh, yeah. this is what it means, yeah? It's zero, it means that it's not changing, right? Charge density, current density, it has an opposite sign if you, if you take this equation, yeah? Changing of a, a charge density equal opposite of the changing of the current density, you see? So this is what it means. When we put zero in there, a minus sign means that it should be, if something coming out, something should uh, compensate it coming. This is why it has an opposite sign. Um, And then we come to the force, Lorentz force. Yeah, this is, you've seen it already. This is the force which is describing the movement of any particle under electric and magnetic field. The most useful, we call it Lorentz force. And if we, again, look at that, our gravitational force, right? We came from gravitational force to electric force, charge and electric field. And if you look in here, now I have to move this again. Like this. So you see, I think you can be, you can quite easily see, I will, we'll see it later, but it's quite clear, right? We came from gravitational to electric force. Here it is. And this is the thing, the thing done for a magnetic field. Okay, here we should have the velocity uh, as well. We have a particle moving in there. And uh, this is for us, um, because magnetic field created by a moving particle, but this is for us a very easy way to represent force which guides our particle inside uh, when it's in the field, yeah? To describe magnetic and electric field, to describe the force which is acting on our particle inside of these fields. Um, yeah, again, we can uh, talk about... Uh, uh, that in terms of force density, again, we have many charges, as we have charge density, we have current density, we can talk about force density, the same thing, because we don't want to talk only about point charge. And uh, the final thing, all of that comes together. This was just yeah, the little introduction which terms we are using inside of electromagnetic theory. And this all together put into Maxwell equations. It exists in two forms, in differential, in integral form. Usually you see it in this way, yeah, with all the Snabler operation, uh, operators. And uh, uh, maybe it's easier to memorize. Right? If you look at that, you see electric field described, magnetic field described, yeah, interplay between both of them. And actually, this time, uh, here, this is a little addition which Maxwell was uh, adding to the, um, uh, to the Ampere law when he connected electric and magnetic field, when he understood that this is actually gives the same and they, uh, they can. Uh, work together. This is uh, electromagnetic field or not two independent uh, forces in our universe. But if you look at them, they, they look quite symmetric to each other. And without this term, they were quite um, plasma and independent even uh, of each other. Here it's an integral form, which gives you a better understanding because we are, yeah, 
you already you you talk about space or you talk about circles in here or you talk about volume in there you integrate over uh, some given uh, uh, volume, space, or circle, and it's easier to understand when you look at the picture like that, right? That if you take um, charge going through the space, given space, or uh, the space has a boundaries of this circle, then if we talked about some number operators and stuff like that, uh, I'm going in the wrong direction. We just slowly go one by one in here, I don't want uh, you to, to even to memorize it, but it's, when you understand what it talks about, then you don't really need to memorize it. You will come up with that by yourself. So this is where we start. We start with electrostatics. We start with electrostatics. Let's take a look at these equations again. So if we have electrostatics, we, we don't have all of them. We don't have to treat all the equations. Which will be left? So, uh -huh. so? Yeah, yeah, and there is actually, I, I, I didn't take it away from uh, the slide. It's actually like this, yeah? We are left only with two equations, and this one is the first one, which talks exclusively about electric field, and this one, the magnetic field is equal to zero. So this is what electrostatic will do for us. So, Coulomb force. Who remembers Coulomb force law? It's the inverse square law, essentially. Same as the uh, Newton gravity force law. Uh, F equals to uh, Newtonian, uh, the K, K, K is uh, an arbitrary constant, and then uh, two charges multiplied over R squared. Absolutely. The classical. Uh... Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And uh, so this is a uh, um, clump force, which um, most of us deal, dealt with, I, I'm sure. And you know that this is in the school, I think we, we learn all of that. and. Uh, yeah, like charges uh, repel and like charges attract, and the force uh, between these two point charges is like that. It's Gleb, was it you? Yeah. 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 Uh, if you have two charges, then uh, we have yeah a constant, and it's inverse proportional to the distance uh, square of distance between them, and this is the charge of these particles. Uh, so we see, actually, if you look on the constants for electrostatic, and it uh, depends on the uh, permittivity, uh, either in vacuum, if it's a zero, or it's uh, of the material, but it doesn't even matter, it's just some constant. And then if we take a Gauss law, you see in an integral form, yeah, this is what we had with an integral form. Uh, from Maxwell equations. And uh, take a particle of a charge Q and the radius of this particle is R, and this is a particle, and this is a um, Gaussian sphere of radius R uh, small, and we want to electric field be in this sphere, so it should be around the particle, it should not be smaller than the particle itself. And then we start to transform our Gauss equation. It actually, yeah, uh, as we have an equal angular distribution, we take only, uh, we have to consider symmetry in here. So we have to see that the field is equally symmetrically distributed. And then when we do that, in, we, we just come up with that. I, you can follow the calculation in here, but this is quite easy mathematical equation, which I, uh, we don't want to, you can try to repeat that, but it's basically written in there. And what you come up with at the end, if you calculate the electric force coming out of Gaussian, uh, 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 Gauss law, uh, slow, yeah, you will come up, the electric force is exactly that, 
and then uh, electric field, and then you calculate the force, you multiply, you remember, force is electric field multiplied by the charge. And this is what you see, Q1, yeah? This is if you put a charge inside there, Q2, this is a constant, and this is inverse of the radius. Uh, natural, you, uh, our unit will become one, yeah, this is just a transform, but this, yeah, this is a unit uh, uh, vector, and this is all. So you see, we have, we, we see here, this, we were calculating from Gauss law, we were calculating our electrical field or electrical force, and we come up that the force is very familiar to Coulomb force. So it's basically the same thing, you don't need to go any further, and Coulomb force, an interaction between two particles, uh, over a certain distance, we know quite well, we understand quite well. So, again, what we were talking at the very beginning, yeah, uh, electric field is nothing but just a map which interacts, which uh, interacts with our particle put inside of this map, and we have to know the conditions of this interaction. Uh, okay. Imagine now we have uh, two interaction particles, yeah? We have a particle one, Q1, which we put at the very, um, the, uh, at some point, and let's say it's glued with a super glue to this place, it cannot move, and we take a particle um, two, the charge two, and we move this <coughs> particle away. Yeah, and if they are uh, alike, yeah, uh, the, then uh, they should repel. And but if we try to, yeah, we uh, it's it starts going and it's uh, accelerating. It's gaining kinetic energy and then it's losing potential energy. This is just a normal way it's going. So it's reaching some way, and we take that at the very end, some way in the infinity, the potential energy would be zero. So, if we then try to bring this particle back to, to the first one, this one is fixed, and this one we need to bring back. What do we do? We have to put some work into that, yeah? We start from potential equals zero, and we try to, as, as it repels, it will take some work to bring it back. So, you bring it back, you calculate the work which is needed to bring it back, and this is will be actually your potential energy, yeah? The calculation to, to take it from the infinity to bring it back to there, and this is how you calculate your, uh, your potential energy will be equal to work you have to put on this chart. And uh, again, um, the calculation is uh, quite simple mathematically. I'm saying quite simple, and I start to, to keep my myself for that. I, I try to write it down in this way, usually on the slides. Is it understandable for, for you? Yeah? Because these are quite easy integration, I think, but usually I have, yeah, you're still, uh, yeah, is it, is it okay with you, this, this way, how it is written in there? Do you understand the integration? Not always? Most of that? If you give me it. Two minutes I can explain, but in 10 seconds I can walk. If you give me two minutes, I can explain. Yeah, go ahead. We have these two minutes. Uh, We're here for that. In my homeland, our educational system is very similar to Britain. Mm -hmm. After 10th grade, you choose profiles. And then I first went for mathematics and informatics. Mm -hmm. But because of problems with teachers, then I went to another school. And then I went to chemistry and biology but never wanted to become a doctor or all, all my I would say all my teenage years I w wanted to work with computers physics mathematics it's just my thing but uh, uh, we learned <coughs> great things about physics in our chemistry classes there at at the end and like when we started with this program uh, profile mathematics informatics at 11th grade I learned these things and kind of understand them, but then 
when I moved to another school, uh, my profile was biology and uh, biology and chemistry, and the mathematics were were not profile mathematics, like normal mathematics. So I do with learn such things, and I remember this and that, but cannot go deeper. Oh, okay, so uh, what you need to do with that? I mean, we cannot go now through integration and integration group, but these are quite simple integration groups, okay? And for example, here we integrate from uh, uh, infinity to the distance r between the particles, yeah? And over uh, this distance, but what you need to, you just need to take a look how it works, integration, okay? And as you will have these slides, Every step is basically written in here. It's it's really uh, when you understand what it means for you would be, become straightforward how you come from here to here. Here, for example, you easily can see force is charge multiplied by electric field. This is just a number you can put it out of integration. I won't go through all the details, but. When you understand the integration rules, you will see that, again, these are just numbers which you can put outside. It doesn't depend on this variable, okay? Inside of integration, you only keep the uh, functions which depend on this variable. These integrals were like squares of numbers, and I, I forgot them, but there were like some triangle rules how we... You have the rules yeah. how you integrate and, yeah, so we don't go through that, but I just wanted to make sure that, as I said, if you look at, if you look at the simple integration uh, rules, then you have step by step the really region in here, it's not a difficult calculation. Because this is like, here, when we left you that, this is an integration rule that, uh, 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 over um, inverse um, uh, square of radius, yeah, would give you uh, that when you integrate. And the, the, this is very, you just need to know that. So, potential energy. We calculate, yeah, we calculate the potential energy when we have two charges, yeah, as I said, that the work we need to apply, this is stored in potential energy. <laughs> And we know, yeah, the total energy is kinetic and potential energy. First, it was moving away. Kinetic energy was going up. Potential energy was going down. It's, uh, it's zero at the very end, potential energy. But when we have to bring it back, the work to bring it back is uh, stored in potential energy. But if we have, uh, very important for us, uh, the thing when we talk about many charges, when we are talking about charge distribution, yeah, charge uh, density, current density, we always talk about many charges in a given volume. How do they interact with each other? With each other, they are inside of this volume. And actually, this is very simple, we just take a sum of the contribution of each pair of particles. Okay, so if we have, for example, a triangle, so you can see in here, we have first and second particle, we have second and third, and we have first and third, and we have to take into account each contribution interaction which, between each of them. And the sum of all of that will give us uh, the right answer. Is this clear? Yeah. So, um, again, Uh, we are talking about potential and we can talk about electric potential as well. The electric potential uh, energy per charge unit is an electric potential. Uh, and uh, actually, if we can take and combine two Maxwell equations, which we were talking about at the very beginning, yeah, we can come with what is called in uh, physics a Poisson equation, and we can rewrite it in the terms of uh, electric potential. And yeah, uh, so then you see we can uh, put all of that. If we don't have any uh, charge density, then we can transform Poisson equation. 
uh, we can put it into zero and we transform Poisson equation in a Laplace equation and we can just write in a simple harmonic function and when we work with wave equations we always have to deal with harmonic functions. It just mathematics how you transform you know from one variables to another it doesn't even it doesn't give much of physical meaning in here it's just more the um, mathematics in with which we deal in electrodynamics all the time and what is behind uh, behind this mathematics yeah which units we take to um, to use in there, which this is just our choice. I, arbitrary choice, it's not really uh, propagated by any uh, special law of physics. This is our choice, how we put a definition. We just take uh, electric potential per unit charge and we call it, or, or, yeah, uh, electric potential, electrostatic potential, and then we try to convert it in something else to deal with that as a harmonic function, just to simplify our life. This is a mathematical function. Why it's important for electrical, uh, uh, electric potential uh, in uh, this particular case? Because quite uh, a lot we use in quantum mechanics, we use magnetic potential. Uh, it's a difficult story why we need, again, it's a mathematical description why it is used in quantum mechanics, but nevertheless, we use formulated magnetic potential. And as we have magnetic potential, we have to bring electrical, poten electrical potential. It, it, it sounds chaotic, yeah? But do you understand what I'm trying to say? This is a mathematical dis description. It's not much of, for the physical meaning. It's more for mathematical description, which you find when you look in a classical study books. If you open Jackson, for example, quite many equations, they are formulated through electric and magnetic potential. You, you just... Mean, uh, you mean if you try to explain why we get to number E equals yeah, zero? Yeah, exactly. Yes, no, no, no. Why we get to number equals zero, this is clear. This is if we, you don't have any uh, charge, charge uh, density, then it's equal zero. This is just conversion from one equation to another. What I mean in here, it's just how you come from one stage to another. This is just a mathematical formulation, nothing else. Okay? In how we come to harmonic function in when we have a number of square and all of that. This is how we come to Laplacian. This is just mathematical no, functions which are used in quantum mechanics. Okay? Uh, yeah. This we already talked about, about principle of superposition. So we have to... Uh, it's the same for... Um, Mm, my God, as we as we said that for electric uh, potential energy, we can say the same for electric field. It would be the same uh, sum of individual electric fields. So it applies for any uh, anything in electromagnetic theory. The same would be for magnetic stuff. And when we talk about continuous distribution of charge, we are talking about charge equally distributed along some space, I mean, or line. So if you take uh, a line, if you just uh, calculate it along the line, propagate it along the line, we have to integrate along the line in here, yeah? And uh, if we calculate it along, uh, on this for the surface, or we calculate it in the volume, we always assuming that it's symmetrically distributed, equally distributed among all the parts of this volume. Okay, so this is what we uh, mean when we talk about continuous distribution of the charge. And if we take classical uh, field theory, we usually apply this distribution for all mathematical formulas. Okay? Oof! We can have a drink because we came to magnetostatics now. So, uh, uh, again, the same when I go to magnetostatics, what I'm trying to explain in, in, uh, in that, 
the not the the whole thing which uh, exists in there, but mostly uh, mathematical formulation which is used uh, inside of all classical books which you apply when you do the calculation when we talk about electromagnetism yeah, or, electro, or, uh, or movement of charged particle in the field and what is used inside of formulas applied inside of our calculations at CERN as well. Uh, so how you, uh, I try to show you how from this mathematical apparatus, quite sometimes nasty, which doesn't mean anything, you come back, or actually we are coming from this direction, how you come to, uh, to the simple things, yeah? The charge, the surface, the field, column uh, force. This is the, the only thing I am trying to show by that. So let's now tell which loads we will use in this case, and then we have a little pause. Magnetostatics. First we had electrostatics, right, and we use these two, so what would be here? Well, you obviously probably won't need the first one because you, it doesn't deal with magnetic forces at all, mm -hmm. so you will need uh, the uh, second one, uh, the, thir the third one will probably remain, and in the last one you will cut out uh, the uh, charge, uh, charged part, essentially. Mm -hmm. Actually, we yeah. take away, we take the way, we have a static field, we take away the third one right from okay. the yeah. The third one, yeah, we take away as well, because we are talking, uh, here you see what this means, yeah? It means that magnetic field changing in time, right? And we are talking about the static one. And this is why it would be taken away as well, Gleb. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, right, we stay with the second one and we stay with a partial of the fourth one. So, uh, a little pause. Oh, any questions? Can we ask questions about the Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, breathe for a little. I actually want to undress because it's all hot. So, 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We want to finish as soon as possible. Ну, успей, быстро. Еще час, и я вас отпущу. It's also kind of funny talking about the fact that those potentials, they uh, kind of don't make sense physically right now, but when it comes to actually quantum field theory, they start to make sense because exactly. uh, you introduce them for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Gleb, this is the thing that they start to make sense because we are talking about classical field theory, yeah, and they mostly need for us in a quantum field theory, especially the magnetic one, okay? And it starts to make sense, and this is actually the existence of um, a magnetic potential in quantum field theory prevents us from um, existence of magnetic monopole in classic field theory. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. I know about this funny thing. And it's come, of course, I mean, there is a physical law always behind, but we need a mathematical description. And what is uh, happening, quite nasty thing, which happens, in my opinion, that we use a lot of mathematical description and we don't even know where it comes from, yeah, and why we're using it there. And when it doesn't have a proper physical meaning, you don't understand why it is there. You just play with uh, operators, yeah? Curl, divergence, what it means for you, right? Uh, where it comes from. You just calculate and calculate, but you have to understand that it exists for some reason in there. I mean, there is also a run of bomb effect where essentially, even though the blue fields are zero, the potential still affects the charge. 
it's mostly a quantum quantum mechanical effect, so that's why you also need them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing talking about magnetic statics and magnetic field. Uh, just let's go back for a moment to Lawrence Force. Yeah, so we have charge, charge we need for electric and for magnetic field, right? So charge gives us an electric field. Whenever we have a steady point charge, we have an electric field. But for a magnetic field, we need something else, right? What? What is this something else? It's written in the, the V is... Moving exactly, it should move. So steady charge. So just a charge gives a rise to electric field, but uh, we need a current. We need a moving charge. I would just install a call. No, first I was hot. Now I'm cold. I'm just changing my mind. This is real woman. Yeah. Current give a rise to magnetic field. So uh, we need uh, a steady current when we talk about magnetic static. It's like magnetic static, yeah, static, not moving. But what is happening in there? It's a current. It's steady current. It's a continuous flow of charges which are moving all together, and we don't have uh, charge. Uh, Density, yeah, it's uh, we took it away. So let's think about we we left with um, these equations like this, yeah, the first one and the second one. And the first thing to no, not here. So the first thing to think about is like um, what it is a steady current, yeah. We have this remember this continuity equation which we had at the very beginning. When I was saying that we need this net charge, yeah, uh, to to move in or out to compensate, but in this case we have a charge density unchanging. We were talking about magnetic static. We took electrostatic away, so we just left with this equation, yeah, a steady current, and mm, it mathematically it. It means that if a current flows in a some region of space, equal current mu must be flowing out of to avoid the built up of charge. But the thing is, uh, like, how do we see that this steady current in the nature? Mm. Imagine a simple wire, yeah. And what we have in a simple wire, we have uh, electric charge moving inside of the wire. But we need a compensation in and out because if they are moving in there, and we should not have this, right? We need a compensation. We need to balance it out. And what is balancing it out is a positive ion lattice around. So to compensate for charge density that it doesn't change, this is uh, how we do that. Electric charge inside of the wire, they are allowed to move as long as they move all together. And to compensate, it is a positive ion on the top to get a zero uh, charge density. Yeah, is it clear, right? How it works? Charge density, it should be zero. Shouldn't be any charge uh, in a given volume. But we have, we need moving uh, electrons. Let's say, so. If we have these moving electrons, we need to compensate it with something. On the, in the wire, it would work like this. There are moving electrons, but there is positive ion lattice, which would compensate it, give us charge density zero in a given region. Yeah? Um, so, uh, we coming back to, we, we are going to the ampere low. This is, this is what, uh, when we talk, when we start to come to magnetostatics or any magnetic field, what we need to remember always that we are moving, okay? And if it's moving, we have to observe the direction of movement. Uh, and 
we actually can write down the, uh, we can take an ampere law um, from the Maxwell equations and we can actually represent it in an uh, integral way. Again, we have a given space and we have a boundary of this space C and we have to see that we always observe uh, the direction of movement, how our current is moving yeah, and uh, direction of our field. And then for that, we just, this is what I'm, ah, not here, yeah, we have to, to calculate our current in relation how our current is connected to our magnetic field. We have to use a, is it called Puravchuk? Yeah, Puravchuk rule in, in Russian. Uh, right hand uh, thumb rule. Yeah, uh, so you see in here, we have a direct connection because we have a current density from the uh, um, Maxwell equation in here, but we already at the very beginning of the slides when I was defining the current density in the very first slides, I was saying really with the same with the same formula, I believe. Ding, 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 ding. Here you are. You see, we defined it like this. We defined current as an integral over the yeah, current density of a given space. Voila. So then we have uh, magnetic field on one side and the current on the other side. Uh, and what we have to remember when we calculate, when we do the calculation, we have to uh, take the direction into account using right hand thumb rule. Um, we won't stop too much uh, on that right now, but what is the primary usage of uh, Ampere's law is calculating um, magnetic field for different uh, electric current. Normally, when we use some, when what we use in our accelerator and our electrons, we know the current and we need to calculate the magnetic field which is created. And this is actually what Ampere law gives us. It's not enough for a complex calculation. We need to uh, do have some extensions as a primary calculation. You have the direct relation between the current electric current and magnetic field. There are just some um, formulas which you can uh, use when you calculate it for different devices. So here again we had electric potential and we have vector potential in magnetostatics and this is again, this is just to guarantee the mathematical calculation. We have to define uh, to guarantee solution to this equation, we can write as a curl of some vector field, and we call this vector field vector potential. Again, this is a mathematical representation for magnetic field, which is quite a lot what we discussed with Gleb already, which is quite a lot used in quantum uh, uh, field theory and quantum mechanics. You need it, but it's just a mathematical apparatus which you're using in there. What is interesting to look at that and what we um, discuss as well, in principle, if you look on the comparison, yeah, electric and magnetic field, but if you uh, look on the equation in this way, uh, this one, you see, there is an electric charge, charge density on top in there, meaning there is an electric charge. But in here we have zero, which means that there is no magnetic monopole uh, exists. So Maxwell equation tells us that there is no magnetic <coughs> monopole exists. Uh, there were some theoretical discussions about that, how mathematically you can represent it, how you can rewrite it. The biggest, again, what for me sounds funny, that the biggest stop over for existence of magnetic Monopole is the fact that we, this is a mathematical representation. Um, vector potential is a mathematical representation. And vector potential can be only defined if there is no uh, magnetic monopole, if there is zero in this equation. So 
we can get rid of magnetic or oh, vector potential. Say, let's define it uh, mathematically some other way. Let's define some magnetic charge. But then we lose vector potential, mathematical description, mathematical representation. And then you say, okay, we leave with that in electrodynamics in classical one. But then we come to quantum one, we use it a lot. In a, it's quite a lot represented and we cannot get rid of that that easily. So um, it's a bit a weird conclusion, yeah, a bit a weird discussion, but this is just to, for you to keep it in mind that many things in here as well in mathematical representation which was defined this way. Yeah, it's like when we're talking about speed of light, how we calculate it, right? We define it in this way. We define meters in this way. We define uh, vector potential in this way. Uh, another thing which is important in... Uh, um, in magnetostatics is like we talk about in electrostatics we talk about uh, Coulomb law yeah and uh, some representation in Coulomb law in electrostatics and what I was saying all the time that Maxwell was combining electricity and magnetism all together and he found the way to put it together, and actually he found, and I will show that a little bit later, that he found that uh, speed of light comes out the same in uh, from electric or magnetic field, and then we need to have the same representation of magnetic field. We kind of put an uh, analogy, yeah, we, uh, the same way. We have electric potential, we have magnetic potential, yeah, vector potential in magnetic field. We have... Coulomb law in uh, in Gauss law in um, electrostatics, we have to have the same thing in magnetostatics, just to show how it uh, comes out the same. And so, in um, actually, uh, it was uh, these were two French scientists which discovered that, and they were just taking a compass and putting yeah some um, uh, wire and they or putting it into some. A magnetic fields, they could see that uh, there is a, there is a current created if you pull the compass in magnetic field, and the needle would uh, uh, go in different direction. And they said that you cal can calculate it. So basically, if you look at that, yeah, uh, you have again uh, the distance, uh, the square of distance over proportional to magnetic field is over proportional to square of distance, and then. You have this is uh, the current in here, yeah, in some uh, lens, so mm, uh, in some wire. But this is just a field, yeah. If we apply, um, if you calculate the force, we have uh, in addition the charge, yeah. Remember, force would be charge multiplied, yeah, by. Uh, velocity, uh, product of velocity and magnetic field. So this is what you see. This is a current, moving charge. Velocity multiplied by charge will be, again, a moving charge, right? It will be two times current divided by uh, square of distance. Yeah? Is it clear? Can you see that? Mm. So then, yeah, this is a just uh, if we have only, let's say, if we have only uh, electric field, yeah, and we see that uh, electric uh, force is always in direction of the field, but magnetic field, as we have a moving particle, yeah, uh, then it will be not that, it will be in circles again, and this, again, in the Lorentz force, uh, charge, electric field, moving particle, magnetic field, and if we um, have the magnetic field, then uh, the force is perpendicular to the velocity and to the field itself. And this is again, this is my favorite picture, which I show all the time, the right uh, hand thumb rule. And you can easily yeah, uh, think about Berlusconi when you try to find this one will be your magnetic field, the force, and the velocity of the particle. Um, because remember, we always have to think about the direction. Yeah, 
the uh, induction law. What I want to, I won't go much into details in here. The only thing which I want to mention in Faraday's law of induction, um, there is a very interesting thing. Think about that, right? What I was saying at the beginning as well. We have a charge. Uh, we have an electric field and magnetic field. Yeah, if we put charge into magnetic field, right, uh, and we have a current created in there. So there is one current, and we can calculate this. Uh, if you know current, amperes law, we can calculate the magnetic field. But the charge starts to move, it will calculate again a magnetic field. And there will be one magnetic field, which we had already, where we put our charge, but the charge, moving charge itself, will create another magnetic field, which is, will be in the other opposite direction. If you take a look at this picture and if you start to apply the right hand up rules and if you put it along here, yeah, uh, depending how you put your hand, you see you put it along the magnetic field, you have the current, but when you put it along the current, you will have an opposite magnetic field created in opposite direction. And this is a secondary effect and this is induced magnetic field which is created to actually to keep our nature alive, because imagining if the charge put into the field starts to, in electric field, magnetic field, if the charge starts to move and creates a magnetic field, and then this magnetic field goes in the same direction, it will raise to infinity, and uh, we'll have a problem with the uh, existence of magnetic field of our Earth or our universe. So it should be uh, counterproductive magnetic field created. Oh, do we need to go to wave function? Yeah, really quickly, just for... Uh, I won't go too far in all of that so we don't get um, tired and bored and uh, swamped in all these equations. The only thing I want to mention, if we take the static case of electric and magnetic field, yeah, all Maxwell equations, and we uh, try to solve them, uh, we can write the wave equation, and actually out of this, we have, you see, all the time we had magnetic and electric uh, strengths of the field, of strengths of electric field, strengths of magnetic field, what we call mu zero and uh, epsilon zero, and these numbers, these constants were really well calculated, and doesn't matter, Either you solve wave equation for electric field or you solve wave equation for magnetic field, you come up with the solution for the speed of light would be the same. You come up with these numbers always uh, either from one or another and you will have the speed of light always the same. doesn't matter which field, uh, field induces it. And this was... Uh, uh, quite an amazing discovery of Maxwell when he started to do this equation and started to solve wave equations in a different way. And he came up with this phenomena that speed of light is unchangeable. Uh, I just found that this is more... Let me think about that. This is a... a um, yeah, okay, uh, the only thing which I want to maybe stop in here um, is that quite often, yeah, uh, when, we, when we start to deal with, we, we won't get a description of wave equation, we don't touch it today, we can go home earlier, but if we talk about wave equations and electric and magnetic field, we have to deal with the different um, quantities and we define through uh, different quantities. We usually don't use um, wavelengths. We usually use a wave number uh, in our calculations, especially in high energy physics and accelerator physics. We don't talk about uh, wavelengths, we talk about wave number. Why we are doing that? Because this is more um, convenient for This is defined through wavelengths as well, as you can see, yeah, through frequency or through wavelengths. But this is more convenient 
uh, way to use for the calculations of the property of different um, of different uh, RF cavities or waveguides. This is accelerator physics, uh, an application in accelerator physics. But we have always think about when we take our beam in uh, in LHC, right? What do we do with that? Because it's all theory. But then we have to apply this theory for something else, right? For real life. And we either want to store our field in some place, in some box, or we want to propagate our beam um, through our uh, um, uh, pathway and uh, this is how we, we use different like uh, boundary condition different calculations uh, which is nice to look maybe on the slides it's quite a lot uh, described in there we we have to Think about which wavelength or which k number we can use. It has to be different, or it has to be integer, or it has to be half integer. It has to fit into our box if we talk about a ref cavity. Mm. Uh, so there are different conditions apply in there. But uh, what is the biggest application? Why I'm mentioning this in here? We talk about field. Yeah, we talk about electrostatic, electromagnetic. But then we start to move and we have to propagate our beam somehow. And this is what we do. We do the calculation of the properties of our beam and how we have to build our apparatus around to propagate this beam inside of our circle. Um, just, uh, yeah, the stupid question in here. Mm, uh, you don't need to know anything about uh, electrodynamics. You need to think about um, uh, what do we want to do with the beam. Imagine we have a beam and we want to uh, store this beam, this field. We, we want to store this field for whatever reason in the box. How many boundary conditions we have then on which um, plane? I mean, it depends on the dimensionality of the question. If it's the two-dimensional questions, then we, if we are talking about, of we course, this. We volume, We in a volume. Oh, any volume. Okay, that all, that uh, then. I mean, technically, if we uh, look at the static picture, then we can cut the uh, Cauchy problem, and then we only arrive to the boundary equation. For example, if it's a three-dimensional volume, then we would need uh, an equation for. Uh, since it's a, uh, it's it mostly would be like uh, one boundary equation that will just define that it's zero on the volume, and the second one would probably be something related to like the uh, smoothness of the so, volume. Listen, this is much more simple because if you want to store the field, you have. Let's put it another way: if you have uh, uh, to store a field in the box in RF, cavity, yeah. or you want to uh, propagate it, what would be the difference? I mean, if you want to store it in a cavity, you would want uh, the field to be zero on the surface of the cavity and outside of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, exactly. So it means... Uh, how That's you why you how make you longitudinal uh, components to be zero, while the tangential ones are not zero. Because as I've said, you need one that would define essentially smoothness, and the smoothness is mostly defined by a tangential uh -huh. field uh, on the surface. And then the ones that are essentially meant to represent how fields go outside, you just zero them out. But if you, you want just don't them. even need to think about smoothness. You just think about out of the box. You have A, B, and C dimensions of your box, right? And you have to have field zero on every dimension. So you have three conditions. If you need to propagate it, then you uh, define yeah, uh, the boundary around, like we have a circle of a box, but the third one is still uh, still uh, open for you. Another thing which actually uh, need to be mentioned when you calculate the wave function, uh, the only thing which comes out in here, um, the they have to be all um, this wave number vector, yeah which is related to uh, wavelengths, yeah, to our wave, 
and our electric field and our magnetic field amplitude, yeah, E0 and B0, this is amplitude, they should be perpend mutually perpendicular to each other, yeah, to, uh, so we have to be able to propagate our wave, to have a wave function when we can propagate the wave, we have to have perpendicular, mutual perpendicularity, and one more thing in here, our electric field and magnetic field for propagation of our beam, of our particles, has to relate to each other by C factor, by the speed of light. Okay? So, the uh, amplitude. Yeah, I'm not talking about uh, total, but the amplitude. Otherwise, we have a problem with the propagation. Ta, this is about, uh, I'm just looking at you and I'm uh, um, thinking about how do we define, there are many things which has to be defined and thought about when we are talking about moving electromagnetic wave, yeah, we have to think about conductors, yeah, we have to think about material which we are using, how it's a skin depth, right, is a, uh, defines how far into our um, material, uh, the wave can go, and uh, the perfect conductor is just, there is uh, no, uh, no boundaries, yeah, the time to recovery is basically goes to infinity, it absorbs all of that, so we need to think about material which can absorb our wave to stop it or to let it to propagate and how our uh, wave will go down with time depending on our material and what is called the skin depth uh, and uh, yeah how many boundary conditions we have to define if we want to um, store our beam or we want to propagate it along our collider or our accelerator there are many different things to think about as soon as we come to the propagation. Electrostatics and magnetostatics are simple Coulomb, on the big scale is a simple Coulomb law, yeah, one is defined with the charge, uh, one charge multiplied by another and over a square of the radius, another one is a moving charge, meaning speed, uh, velocity of this charge current which we induce from magnetic field again over the distance and this is it then electrical potential and um, vector potential magnetic potential and these are um, things which we define for the static case as soon as we come to non-static case we start to think about material we need to think about real life we start to think about boundary condition connected to this material because everything is static is easy, we don't, I mean, we just calculate the numbers of fields and we don't move it anywhere. So, la la la, but actually, actually, this is what I said, we don't go deep into details today, we just leave it like this, you can take a look on the slides, yeah, if you have the wish to look at them. But I don't think you, you know, if you don't need it until you need it, it's quite useless if I continue for another two hours talking about that and you all fall asleep in here. This is my point. This is why I'm going through that like very quickly. I wanted you to get the primary idea about what is um, electrical phenomena. And I hope... It, what is field about, what is charge about, how easily it is connected to the things which we already know from uh, simple physics. But everything which is connected to the propagation of that in real life, in real experiment, you can look on that on the slides and see if you need any details. Ask me. I can talk about that for another three hours, uh, but I'm not sure we need it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty clear for me here is the transverse electric mode, transverse magnetic mode and wave guides. Yeah, this is what is on this. I, I mean, I'm not only talking about this picture. I basically skip through the whole, yeah, 
uh, wave equations and all this stuff. I mean, but for me, it's pretty clear because it's a bit familiar for me. I, I am just afraid that if I start to go through that right now, we all. Uh, I mean, technically, if we want to talk about uh, waveguides and, for example, uh, resonators, we also need to ar first arrive to Helmholtz equation instead of the wave equation, because normally when you talk about such uh, cavities, you kind of assume that your field is harmonical, so you kind of like take that. First, you have the, to go uh, through that. Yes, Glip. Yeah. So, I mean, we technically also skipped the topic of uh, gauge, gauges, like a uh, Coulomb gauge or like, for uh, example, listen, Coulomb gauge. gauge. If, you, if you start to talk about uh, uh, Coulomb gauge or we start for, yeah, uh, for uh, electric field and we start to talk about Dirac gauge for magnetic field through which we can define basically magnetic charge, uh, it will, of course, this will take uh, another hour. Because there are many things which can be described uh, in this sense. We are not now talking about the course of electromagnetic theory uh, for the whole semester. I just wanted to uh, have it in English, the main definitions. I wanted to show that we have it all very easily connected and everything deeper we can, especially us, I will, but we can always go further, uh, especially through Zoom, Gleb, when I'm coming to Tomsk. <laughs> we can do it every day. <laughs> yeah? Should we? I'm just looking at you and, yeah. I know you love me, but you had enough of me as well over this week. This is what I feel. I just don't want to um, to uh, to leave Tomsk. And it's like, oh my God, if she comes another time. We start to study electrodynamics again. Yeah? But whenever you have, if you, we want to discuss it further, we can go through that. I really wanted us to, to scratch the ground and see uh, what it is about. In the slides, you can have all of that and you can ask, write to me and ask any questions that you need. Uh, um, yeah? My, my question is not. No, it's connected to that, but it's slightly on the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's concerning, uh, I would say, what I, what I learned on my own and then what I read in my student books. I, I learned that uh, every particle that we in books uh, see as particle can behave as a wave. For example, mm -hmm. in, in Bulgarian, this person called uh, Ryon Gen, uh, used to, I think, used to bomb protons, and these protons yielded... Uh, photons, I think. It was electrons or photons experiment. You're talking about observer's effect? And when... uh. Arendian will achieve. It's like... Bef ah, okay. Before... Yeah, then, yes. Then, okay. And then the protons and... And, and he had the solution that every particle, behave, every particle can behave as a wave under certain conditions? I think it started before, much before that, and we started with uh, Young still, another scientist. And this is the effect you are talking about. Um, uh, uh, when the particle can behave as a particle, as an object, as a, uh, like what we were discussing, as a fixed particle, or as a wave. And this is as well why we count in description uh, in, uh, in electromagnetism, we count the description of particle behavior through the wave function because we take particle not only as an object, we take it as a wave as well. And probably what you are talking about, the, there is a very famous experiment when you take uh, the elementary particles and you put them through, you start to count them, how they go through their sleet, yeah, the sleet experiment. This is, and then yeah, and then you see the picture how it behaves. And if, as long as you observe it, you see the behavior of uh, uh, oh, this particle. As soon as you start to watch it, it behaves as a particle. But if you kind of, yeah, you, you but it can have a, um, 
double behavior and sometimes you see that one particle yet can go through two slits as well because it creates an interference picture on their photo paper. This is what you're talking no, about. No, no. Oh, this was like what I said was introduction of my question mm -hmm. and then uh, I'll go back to school material right now. Then when I moved to, to that new school I had to learn all the things other students learn the first uh, semester in school. I had to learn it for one month and it was really hard for me but I remember much of the things. That, uh, there were such things I forgot most of the details but 1S, 2P, uh, the, the electron scales of a uh, atom, electron scales of an atom, when a photon hits an electron it can go to another scale but it should be a precise way not every photon that hits an electron can make it go higher and mm -hmm. higher and uh, if we cannot we learn that we can never find an electron because it behaves as a way if we can never find how a photon hits it that was my question if if there is a law that we can never find an electron because the more you search for it the more probability you, you never find it how can a photon hit an electron if we can never find it if it cannot be seen to go into higher uh, higher energy state. But you observe, wait, uh, I'm a bit uh, lost, maybe I, I, I don't, uh, you observe the effect, but what do you mean you cannot? No, like there is a core and there yes, are... Yes, of course, and there is a, on, the on each orbit you have orbit. an electron and then you hit it and it goes from one orbit to another. Yeah, but... Mm -hmm. What I remember is that it should be a strict wave. A strict wave to go yeah. from one orbit to another. You cannot, yeah, of course, to move it, you, you have to have a, a certain condition to that you allow electron to move from one uh, orbit to another, to the next level, yes. Yeah, and we want that there was a law that you never can find an electron because the more you search for an electron, the more probability you never find it. So if we can never find an electron, how can a photon hit it so it goes? See, colleagues, I don't understand what you're saying. So why do you say that uh, you cannot find what the, can you, the it's electron? Not low. I mean, this is what we can and what we observe yeah, so only the probability. But this is, of course, but this is, yeah, you, you have a probability, the more you define one, the less you define another one, but what it has to do with the law, which law? cannot find it, how it can be mm. hit, like, it should okay. be some place to be okay. hit. Okay, listen, yeah, this is we go to the principles of quantum uh, physics, yeah. In a, uh, if we talk about objects, right, like we define our coordinates, yeah, we uh, have a, a strict um, knowledge about whatever speed and uh, uh, location. But in quantum physics, yeah, you don't define um, you you don't define the uh, exact coordinates. You define everything with the probability. This is a Heisenberg principle, and you in as soon as you the thing is in the as uh, soon as you know more about one, you the probability the probability together should should be equivalent, right? As soon as you go up to you know more about one, you know less about another one, right? But it doesn't mean that you know nothing about another one, right? You just the probability you can find an electron in this place can be higher or lower, but it doesn't mean that you don't know anything about that. It's not deterministic anymore, it just defines the probability uh, of your knowledge, okay? It's just the principle of quantum, uh, quantum physics that you don't work anymore with the uh, uh, concrete numbers you work with probabilities. What is the probability I find this electron 
on this orbit, or what is the probability that it will with this, um, uh, yeah. Uh, this is yeah. 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 In, uh, I think it starts with orbit starts with one S, and I forgot the number, but there are in orbit numbers one S and. I just wait. When it was the physicist of the day, uh, so let me just take a look at that if there was something. Uh, uh, what you saying is that uh, when, uh, when photon catches the electron on the low level, then, mm -hmm. he, then he gets a higher level, the result of this is also probability. It's not uh, precisely uh, known. It's not precisely calculated. It's always... Everything what you calculate in there, it's always calculated through probability. I'm trying to find... I've seen just recently a nice picture explaining this phenomenon. Don't add uh, the car heating, it makes it <laughs> adds additional uh, dimension in the hand, then you get. Should I seen it today? This nice picture this, describing this probability. Uh, and I will find it, I will send it to you. Send me a message and I will send I, I, I There was a nice picture describing this in a very simple manner how the probability. Uh, how do you calculate the probability? What is Dino is trying to explain in an example of you and how you calculate it for, for the particle? We'll find this picture that maybe it will help you. Yeah? Okay. Thank Just you. send me a message. Thank you. For the answer. But uh, I, I, I feel that you don't get to. It, it's a thing about quantum physics as well. Oh, actually, wait. This is on my bookshelf. This I would recommend. Open that, la la la, where is my shelf? It's called uh, Quantum Wars. Ah, la la, the book. What was it called? Sorry, it's a Sim Carol, the author. Uh, Yeah, it's quantum war, war, it's called. Look at that. World or wars? World. Mir. I mean, the whole uncertainty principle and the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics mostly ties up to the fact that we both use groups there and we also connect uh, quantities that are mostly have the uncertainty relationship between them to Fourier transform, which kind of turns down to Pontragon duality between those groups and kind of like forms it like with the whole uh, commutator part essentially. Like they should not, uh, if they don't commute, then you can calculate that they will have a certain uncertainty uh, principle for them. 
it essentially applies uh, the same for uh, the normal statistical physics where you could also have uh, two quantities connected by Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. And they will also have uncertainty principle tied to them. about that um, we are not talking about exact numbers for that here yeah, we are really talking about probabilities if we define even when we define a new particle and we have they say that we have the discovery this is a certain probability that it displays the certain particle with these conditions which represents uh, the particle described by the theory exists okay there is nothing determined so we observe an object, if you read scientific papers, we observe the objects with, with the probability blah, 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 uh, uh, repeats the properties of whatever black hole, so Higgs particles described by the standard model or, or whatever. So it's always like this. We don't deal with the certainty in there. You always, of course, even when we talk about we calculate the signal and we calculate the background, like what I was showing to you. It's close, still, it's close, right? you, you, you have numbers, right? But nevertheless, these numbers will have a certain probability that they are correct. When I was telling about the errors, yeah, and uh, what is the probability that our results are true, yeah? And we usually, when we talk about, for example, discovery of high energy physics, the probability that our results are correct are quite high, very close to 100%, but it's not that. It's, anyway, it's not absolute yeah. Look at this book, I think this will give you some new ideas. Yeah, and, and maybe that's why maybe you use machine learning to, to, to delete mistakes by the cell systems. It's not only that, I think this is more for complex um, calculations because if you think about this, how um, in many parameters, how many physical um, effects we have to deal and objects, yeah, and how much data we have to transform that it starts to become very complex to take everything into account. This is why it's machine learning using. Hmm? Because it's not any more calculation of one uh, particle movement. Imagine with these energies which we use for these big machines, how many particles you have, how much is the luminosity. Remember, luminosity, it's again, it's not the precise number of uh, how many collisions we have, but this is just what we expect, the probability of what we have that many collisions per given parameters. Understand Russian pretty well, but I cannot speak it. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's similar to my name, mm -hmm. Danish. Thank you. Thank you very much for the yeah. talk. So? Party time. Thank you so much. But what I will think about, actually, I think we need to go through, and I think how we do it, actually, we need to go through particle physics. Like to think about this. Kind of group. We don't, not that much, really, in the practical application, how we do we use and the process which we calculate about. Uh, 
bosons, about muon process, about Feynman diagrams, how do we calculate, because if we have to deal with chi-square features, we have to understand the physics behind it. Maybe this is what we should sometimes see and discuss. This would be more practical, more useful for, for us to, to talk about. I was doing some um, to take more specificity in my job. So I uh, thank you very much. This is a pleasure. Yes. And thank you for coming. We can switch once again. We can switch to Russian now. But first, we have to. Thank you.